Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neeraj Shah, and I am the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I am joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills and Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. We're here today to provide everyone an update on COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. Right now in Maine, there are 4,368 total cases of COVID-19, a decrease of 12 cases since yesterday. Of those, 3,919 are confirmed cases, an increase of nine, and 449 are probable, an increase of three. 131 individuals have died with COVID-19, which is the same number as it was yesterday, and 3,784 have recovered an increase of 22 recoveries. Right now in Maine, eight individuals are currently in the hospital. Five of them are in the ICU, and one of them is on a ventilator. To put that number into a bit of context, that is a hospitalization rate of less than one person for every 100,000 Maine people who is currently in the hospital. The national average for that same number is 15 per 100,000, and the number in Maine right now is less than one per 100,000. Among our cases are 966 healthcare workers. I'd like to next provide a brief update on some of the outbreaks and uh, COVID-19 situations that Maine CDC is involved with right now. Let's start with cases associated with a wedding in Millinocket on August 7th. In total, at this time, there are 60 cases associated with that August 7th wedding and reception in and around Millinocket. Approximately 22 cases are primary cases, meaning among individuals who attended either the wedding or the reception. About 14 of those cases are secondary, meaning a close contact of somebody who attended one of the, the functions. And about 24 of those cases are tertiary, which means that they were close contacts of somebody uh, who was a secondary contact. It's essentially a ring, a, a series of concentric rings that get built out, all emanating from this one August 7th event. One of those rings is an outbreak at the Maple Crest Rehabilitation Center in Madison, where there are a total of six cases. Just for clarification on the numbers here, these six cases at Maple Crest are part of the 60 total cases that I mentioned as part of the greater Millinocket outbreak. Of those six cases at Maple Crest, four are among residents and two are among staff members. I'd like to take a second to dive into Maple Crest a bit just to provide a glimpse as to how quickly this virus can travel. Here's how Maple Crest unfolded. A guest who attended the wedding on August 7th infected their parent. The parent then had contact with another one of their children. That child, that person, works at Maple Crest and infected five people at Maple Crest, four residents and one additional staff member. And all of this unfolded in approximately two and a half weeks. That's just an example of how quickly this virus can spread from a wedding to a guest, to a parent, to another child, to a nursing home. I'd like to next provide an update on a situation that's been evolving at the York County Jail. At that facility, at that complex, there are a total of now 18 cases. Seven of those cases are among inmates at the York County Jail. Nine of the cases are among staff members at the jail and two of the cases are among other staff members who work in and with York County government in that complex. What I wanted to talk about is an update that connects the York County jail outbreak with the Millinocket wedding outbreak. This morning, our disease detectives identified a connection between the wedding slash reception in Millinocket and the York County jail complex. A staff member of the York County Jail attended the event in Millinocket on August 7th. 
And that individual was among the very first confirmed cases at the jail. What these outbreaks show, whether it's the wedding or Maplecrest or the York County jail complex, these recent examples are restaurant quality pieces of information that demonstrate how aggressive and how opportunistic this virus is and how quickly it can move from one community to another. Even if those communities are miles apart, separated by multiple counties in between, what we've learned about COVID-19 is that it can be the uninvited guest at every single wedding, party, or event in Maine. The virus is where we are, and then it comes home with us. I know the governor is going to talk about this, but I think it, it bears underscoring the fact that the virus is everywhere around us. And what we know now is that it's making folks across the state of Maine sick. Now more than ever, the actions that you take today can help keep people in your community safe tomorrow. I'd like to now talk about a situation involving cases of COVID-19 among first responders in and around York County. As we announced yesterday, we are investigating a series of cases linked to the, to the Sanford, Saco, and Buxton Fire Departments. Right now, there are a total of four cases associated with those three departments. Let me begin this discussion by first thanking first responders across the state of Maine. People who on a daily basis are literally running the other way when people are fleeing an emergency situation. For me, this is really personal. Not too long ago, my mother took a fall and broke one of the biggest bones in her body, in her leg. And let me tell you, you have not seen medical skill and professionalism until you've watched a main paramedic insert an IV while bouncing down a bumpy road at 80 miles an hour. First responders in Maine get the job done and they have my utmost and everlasting respect. There have been some concerns that have been raised around testing. So I wanted to discuss those with everyone today. Our laboratory up here in Augusta typically returns results for COVID-19 specimens within about two days. In fact, until late last week, 100% of the specimens for COVID-19 testing that were sent to the main CDC lab were returned to the place that submitted them within 48 hours, 100%. But late last week, we received an unexpectedly high number of specimens in one day from nursing homes across Maine that are testing their staff. In one day, we received an extra 800 specimens on top of the approximately 1,000 per day that we normally get. And as a result of that, the percent of tests that Maine CDC's lab turns around within 48 hours fell from 100% to 99.7%. Our main CDC lab staff came together around this concern and pulled extra shifts on Sunday to ensure that results could be reported out ASAP. I'd like to thank the members of the main CDC lab for taking time on Sunday to come in to make sure that lab tests were reported out to Maine people across the state on Sunday and into Monday morning. Thanks to their work, we are back up to 100%. Now let's take a look at how these numbers look when we apply them to say the Sanford Fire Department. A total of 27 samples came up from the Sanford Fire Department. 17 of those 27 individuals received their results from the main CDC lab within the 48 hour window. But because of the surge of samples that came into our laboratory that I mentioned, 10 fire department personnel received their results not on Sunday afternoon, but on Monday morning. Every one of those results was negative. The notion that this time difference between Sunday afternoon and Monday morning 
could have resulted in an outbreak is not scientifically supported. Why? Well, the most important and critical point here is that these first responders were, for, were close contacts of confirmed cases. That means that they had sustained close personal interaction with somebody who was later found out to be COVID-19, COVID-19 positive. The scientific rule for close contacts of confirmed cases is straightforward. You've got to be in quarantine. That's the only way to truly prevent spread to other people. If these, if these first responders in York County had received their test results one hour after being tested, the outcome would have been the same because they should be in quarantine. If they had received their test results one day after being tested, the outcome would have been the same because they should be in quarantine. If they had received their results two days after being tested, the outcome would have been the same because they should be in quarantine. And so when they received their results, not on Sunday afternoon, but on Monday morning, the outcome was the same because they should be in quarantine. With very limited exceptions that must be approved by the main CDC, this principle that if you're a close contact, you've got to be in quarantine, applies to anyone, whether you're a firefighter, a physician, or a family member of someone who tests positive for COVID-19. You must remain in quarantine no matter what your test result is or when it comes in. To put it differently, if you're a close contact, a negative test result is not a get out of quarantine card. You must remain in strict quarantine to avoid exposing other people. There's one other principle that I think is worth reviewing in light of the situation in York County and Sanford, and that is this. Please do not go to work if you are, feeling, if you are not feeling well. Gone are the days when powering through the workday in the office with a cold was the heroic thing to do. Right now, in an era of COVID-19, Staying home when you are sick is the most heroic thing that you can do. And finally, I'd like to provide an update uh, on some cases on main college campuses. As our colleagues at the college campuses themselves have already reported, there are some cases of COVID-19 at at least two college campuses in Maine right now. At Colby College, Maine CDC has opened an epidemiological investigation after four confirmed cases there. Similarly, within the UMaine system, Maine CDC has opened an epidemiological investigation after confirming a total of five cases across the system, four of which are at the Orono campus and one of which is at the law school. For both situations, the purpose of these public health investigations is to determine what linkages may exist between and among these cases, and most importantly, prevent single digit case numbers from turning into double digit situations. It's important to note that we are aware of both the cases at Colby College, as well as on the UMaine campus, because of the aggressive, the aggressive testing of asymptomatic students, faculty, and staff on both campuses. As I've said before, when you go out looking for things, you find them, especially when it comes to infectious diseases. Both campuses have initiated aggressive testing, monitoring, and contact tracing programs, and we appreciate their collaboration. And finally, a couple numbers before I turn things over to Governor Mills. First, an update on our positivity rate. Our one-day positivity rate, based on 2,508 samples reported to Maine CDC, was 0.44%. That makes our seven day PCR positivity rate 0.74%. For context, that number is where we were in Maine seven days ago, as well as 14 days ago. The nationwide positivity rate remains at 7%, about 10 times higher than Maine's rate right now. And finally, an update on testing volume. 
volume of testing for COVID-19 in Maine has significantly increased. Right now, Maine overall is conducting 244 tests for every 100,000 people across the state. That has increased significantly over the past 30 days by 30%. But here's what's really important. Much of that growth has actually occurred in the past five days. On August 20th, just five days ago, we were doing about 190 tests per 100,000. And now we're doing 244. That's a 29% increase in just a five day period. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Governor Mills. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, everyone appreciates uh, what you do and the important information you bring to the public's attention uh, every week. And uh, you are a good part of the reason, I believe, that this state has remained uh, so safe compared to other states. And we know we can't let down our guard now. We know this could go in, go on for a long time. Um, today marks one month to the autumnal equinox or the official end of summer in Maine and elsewhere. Thanks to the efforts of Maine people and pe good people like Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew and others, and the people of Maine who have largely abided by the public health measures that you put out there to keep us all safe, our state has been largely successful in mitigating the spread of COVID-19 over the past five and a half months. As we gradually reopened businesses and we wel welcomed visitors to our state over the summer, our case numbers and positivity rate remained among the, the lowest in the nation and our economy began to slowly rebound. As of today, as he said, our seven day positivity rate, 0.774, I think you said, correct? Seven days. While the national average is 7%, and Massachusetts, I believe, their seven day positivity rate is 2%. So as of today, August 25th, Maine ranked on a population adjusted basis, third lowest on cases, third lowest in the nation on hospitalizations of 36 states reporting them, eighth lowest on deaths and, and fourth highest on the percent of people recovering out of 45 states reporting. Those are all good statistics, but we know that they are more than statistics. They are not just numbers, they are people. And when Dr. Shaw talks about the, the 3,784 people who've recovered, that doesn't undermine the fact that they were potentially very, very sick for a very long time as well. We don't diminish that fact. I know that for many people, the worst parts of this pandemic feel, can feel far away, like they're in some other country or other state, far away from the relative safety of the state of Maine. And little by little, people tend to start to reconnect with friends people you haven't seen in months because you've been careful. People are venturing out for a small backyard barbecue, maybe a close friend's wedding or drive-in graduation party. It feels almost normal, although it's never not the old normal, especially after the constant worry and anxiety of the last six months and people are finally somewhat relaxing. You forget to wear your mask. You forget to keep your distance but you think it's okay because you live in Maine and the odds are you won't catch anything anyways, right? Wrong. What you don't know is that one person at the party you went to has COVID-19 and doesn't know it, doesn't have a clue. They don't have symptoms, they're not sick, they feel okay. You have no warning, they have no clue. You leave that party, you go home to your family, you see a few friends here and there, you stop by the grocery store for something really urgent and you go back to your desk at work never knowing that you've caught the virus and the virus has caught you and you're exposing others immediately, including people you may never meet yourself. The secondary, tertiary uh, spread of this virus is an incredible phenomenon. This isn't just a possibility, it's a reality. As we know today from your analysis of Millinocket and, and uh, Madison and York County, We've all heard about that now. And a woman who never even attended the wedding or the reception, but who simply interacted with someone else who did attend the wedding or the reception, lost her life to this virus. 60 people are now associated with that one outbreak and its impacts are widespread. One person 
one contact can light a match and spark a fire that we may be unable to put out. And it may cause our healthcare system to be overwhelmed. It may cause people to lose their life, lose their very breath. So as we reach the end of summer, we're beginning a new phase of our reopening with many schools and universities welcoming students back for in-classroom instruction and remote and hybrid instruction, being very creative now. And we're expanding testing to identify and isolate out outbreaks before they spread. And I look forward to another announcement on that tomorrow. But testing alone can't prevent new cases or a new outbreak. Only we can do that as each of us keeps doing our part. I know many of you are tired, you may be impatient, your children are getting anxious. Our society, our families, our communities have lived through a lot more than this and survived. We are all impatient and anxious, but we cannot let down our guard now. Pandemic fatigue will cause, our, will cause fatal consequences for everybody if we don't stay focused on the end game of keeping every one of us safe. It's as important today as it was five and a half, six months ago. So we all have to remember to wash our hands frequently, maintain six feet distance between others and everywhere and other people, no matter where we are, stay home when we can, especially if we're older or have some underlying health condition. And wear a face covering when we're in public, when it's hard to maintain that six feet distance between ourselves and others. Do not attend or organize large gatherings, indoors or outdoors. And even though we put caps on the indoor ga gatherings and outdoor gatherings, that doesn't mean it's perfectly safe for you to go to an indoor gathering or an outdoor gathering because there are fewer than 50 people or fewer than 100. Don't take a chance. Remember that more than 20% of Maine people are over the age of 65. And another significant percentage have obesity, have diabetes, have hypertension, or other conditions that make them vulnerable. It may seem harmless for you, a healthy person, to attend a gathering, but you don't know what's there, what, what may be spread as a result of your attendance there. We have to protect our health and the health of our loved ones. It concerns me on another note, that childhood immunization rates have plummeted in recent months. And parents have avoided going to doctors, for, first of all, because maybe the doctor's offices weren't open for a while, weren't taking in patients. And second of all, now because they're open, but people have a fear of the virus and fear of going to other places, which is generally justifiable. But whether your child may be returning to in-person classroom instruction or not, whether you're keeping your child home and engaging in some form of hybrid learning, getting protected against the flu or other contagious diseases is critical, both as part of our overall public health plan and as part of our efforts to control the COVID-19 pandemic. Any outbreak of whooping cough, whooping cough, for instance, or measles or the flu could also overwhelm our healthcare facilities hospitals that are already working to combat COVID-19. And immunization allows your child's physician to rule out, and rule out preventable diseases and illnesses such as the flu when your child shows symptoms, uh, shows symptoms that are similar to COVID-19. So it's an important part of our attack on the pandemic. Last week, uh, we announced that we are investing nearly $1 million in existing general funds to increase preventative health care for children enrolled in Maine care through temporary, in temporary incentive payments for health care providers. These will offer well child visits, and vaccinations, and dental care during the pandemic. We've also set up immunization clinics throughout Maine to help parents catch up on their child's immunizations. Parents can call 287 4112, 287 4112, Monday through Friday. 8.30 to 4.30 for more information or to schedule an appointment. And we're also working with private insurers to make sure they're covering these well child visits and immunizations, extremely important. So if we protect ourselves and protect one another by taking all these steps and getting updated on our own flu shots and immunizations, we can continue to restart our economy, continue to re reopen schools in a safe way 
and we can limit the spread of this dangerous virus as we welcome fall in the state of Maine. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we'll turn to our colleagues in the media. And the first question today goes to Mal Leary from Maine Public. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah and uh, Governor Mills. Uh, Governor, you're sending a really mixed message here uh, to the public in that we have to be vigilant and we have to try to do our best. But at the same time, things are better than they are in other states. Aren't you worried that folks are going to start saying, well, they really don't know what's going on because they send that kind of a mixed message? I'm sorry, mixed message in that we're, we're advising caution as we have for months on end now. We've always advised caution. And we've always advised that we want to be the safest state we can be. I don't think those are inconsistent. We are safe because people are being cautious and following the guidelines and the checklists. In large part, everyone's following the rules. And we are a safer state than most, almost every other state. I, I don't think maybe the pandemic in itself is, is a paradox. We don't know what to expect, no, but we are, we are basing every decision we make on the most up-to-date medical science the most up-to-date national or even international information we have on what works and what doesn't work. We do know that exactly what we're saying today does work if people comply and for the most part they are complying. Do we know what the end game is with this pandemic? Nobody does. Do we know how long it will last? No, I don't think anybody does. But we know what will help keep us safe and our families safe here in Maine as we've talked about today. That's working. I'm going to turn to Nit Ricker at ABC7 next. Good afternoon. I am wondering um, if uh, there's a connection between the pastor at the Calvary Baptist Church in Sanford, who officiated at the wedding up in Millinocket and the outbreak at the fire department. Um, Nitnoy, um, what I'm going to tell you is that uh, we don't comment on the specifics as they relate to individuals. Um, for privacy reasons, we, we just don't get into that level of detail in order to preserve privacy of patients. Uh, what I can simultaneously tell you is that we have investigated a number of different hypotheses, um, and we're looking when we when we look at different outbreaks, we're always looking for interconnections between them. Uh, but again, to be totally candid, in order to protect privacy, we just don't comment on that level of specificity. All right, you want me to be more vague? Is there any connection between the pastor who officiated at the wedding and the, I mean, let me be less, <laughs> less specific, I guess. Yeah, um, um, I, yeah I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, and um, what I can say is that we investigate every single option, every single alternative, every single notion of connection between these. At this time, the, the, the link that we have found between what is happening at the York County Jail and the wedding reception in Millinocket is related to a staff member at the jail who attended the wedding in Millinocket. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, I don't know if you'll be able to answer because it's probably too specific. Um, is there, uh, the woman who died on Friday is a relative of hers, one of the uh, people who remain hospitalized? Um, similarly there, uh, Nitnoy, we, I just can't, I can't comment on that level of specificity. And this is all for patient privacy reasons. Um, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, um, we can report when someone has passed away, we can report when someone is hospitalized, but the connections between those two could easily allow someone to determine the identity of the person who was hospitalized or the person who passed away. Okay. Um, can I take you back to the original question? Um, did you guys know that there was a connection between the wedding and uh, the church in Sanford? Between the, the, the wedding and the... In Millinocket and the 
church in Stanford. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, the, the church in Sanford is, uh, I'm not sure which one you're, which you're referring to there. Okay. Well, you, I thought I was specific. So did you know that the, there was a church member from a church in Sanford who officiated at the wedding in Millinocket and is, did you know about that connection? Uh, yes, we, we are, we are aware of that connection. Okay. And, Mm -hmm. At this point, there's no connection between that church and the the outbreak at the fire department. It just happens to be in the same town. Th that that is that is our understanding based on the investigation as it stands right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You bet. Uh, okay. I'm going to turn now to Joe Waller at the Press Herald. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, a, a couple questions, and then just a a, a, a quick clar clarification. Um, the, uh, I, I just wanted to get at the, at the, the wedding reception, were the uh, attendees at the wedding reception, were they, uh, um, told by the, the big moose in employees to wear masks? Do you know, and, and or do you know, in general, was there mask wearing <clears throat> at the wedding or at the reception or, or not mask wearing? And then, uh, my other question is, <clears throat> Even though um, testing is more widespread now, is there any or should there be any prioritization of um, testing of, you know, having first responders being getting their results back before others get their results back? And then my clarifying question is just the overall expansion in testing. Is that related uh, in part to the, um, uh, the swab and send sites? <clears throat> sure thing, Joe. So let me let me start with the first question. Um, from what we understand from case interviews done by our epidemiologists of individuals who attended the reception, uh, we understand that mask wearing was not commonplace or widespread. That squares with what we've seen as an epidemiological matter, which is a significant number of cases that arose out of those events. Uh, we're, we're not 100% sure as to the, the depth of the information that the Big Moose Inn provided attendees. We do know that there was signage, but whether there was more, whether it was particularized to individual guests, we're not, I, I'm not sure right now, but we can see what we can do to find out. In terms of prioritizing tests, this is something that we've looked into on many different occasions. Uh, and and the, the bottom line here is that our goal is to return test results for COVID-19 to everybody within 48 hours. There is this notion that test results are, are sort of like folks who are lining up outside of a nightclub and a bouncer could take a section of those folks and just usher them into the nightclub really quickly. Uh, in reality though, high volume testing, like the kind that occurs at the main CDC lab is a lot more akin to a conveyor belt. Things are put on the belt and the fastest way to get the finished product is to let the conveyor belt move through the system. By trying to pick out specific tests and run those, what that requires is stopping the entire production line and literally freezing those samples, not figuratively, but literally taking the samples that are in process and putting them in a minus 80 freezer and freezing them while the other samples can be run. That process doesn't really speed anything up. In fact, what we found from an operational perspective is that it slows down the receipt of results for everybody, including the people that you were trying to prioritize in the first instance, because you've got to start up a whole new production line for them. So we've examined that. We've done some testing of how or whether we could engage in that sort of prioritization. But where we landed was that doing so would actually slow things down both for everybody else as well as the people that we wanted to prioritize. So what we found as an operational matter is that the best way to get everybody results is to make sure that we have the system move as seamlessly and flawlessly as possible. Uh, Commissioner Lambert? Sure. Kim, you are excited that as a we have 27 swab and send sites that are open that allow 90% of people throughout the state of Maine to get a test within 30 minutes of their home. 
just today at the York, excuse me, at the Kittery Visitors Information Center, Pro America has its site set up so you can go and get a swab and send test in York County for the list of all the available sites where you can get these tests for free. You can visit the governor's COVID-19 website. That volume will begin to, it has begun to increase. It will begin to increase even more in the coming days. And we are working our best to make sure that we can continue to provide that high level of turnaround that is consistent with all these types of accurate testing throughout the nation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Is the Tritown Baptist Church going to also be cited? Uh, we're looking into that. A Amy, we're, we're, again, our case investigators are talking to individuals who attended not just the reception, but the wedding. But to be candid, Amy, right now, our focus is on limiting the spread of cases that are related to these events. What we've seen just in the last five hours is a broadening of our investigation that links up what happened in Millinocket at the wedding with now what we've seen at the York County Jail. So right now, our principal focus is on limiting further circles of transmission that are emanating from that event in Millinocket. Okay, and last week you gave us an update on what percentage of people associated with the Millinocket outbreak were symptomatic. Can you provide a further update on that as well as how many people who were either at the wedding or are in the secondary or tertiary circles have been hospitalized? Sure, so as of, uh, as of right now, 83% of the cases associated with the Millinocket wedding have shown symptoms. And um, in terms of hospitalizations, there have been two hospitalizations associated with that. Um, th that gets, you know, we, we get into some definitional questions, Amy, because we are also including within that Maple Crest, but not yet including the York County Jail. But right now, it's been two individuals associated with um, with with the Millinocket wedding who have been hospitalized. Okay, thank you. And just a real quick follow up. Earlier, you were talking about a possible outbreak and uh, among Saco, Sanford, and I believe you said Buxton first responders. But I don't think you actually said how many people are involved in that. Right now, there are four cases among first responders who have split their time or worked across those three departments. And we're investigating and working with additional departments that may have had exposures related to those individuals. Great. Thank you. You bet. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Um, I just want to drill down a little bit more about the connection between the York County Jail and the Millinocket outbreaks. So um, what, what it appears is that a staff member from the jail attended the wedding and then tested positive. Is that right? That is correct, Patrick. Okay. And how many people have been, have been sickened at each locale? Just so I'm sure I have the most current numbers. Within the York County Jail? In, at the jail and also how many positive cases are there connected with the wedding outbreak? Okay, so at the jail, Patrick, there are 18 total cases. Uh, nine of them are staff members at the jail. Two of them are other staff members associated with York County government, and mm -hmm. seven of them are inmates. And then in at the Millinocket wedding, there are a total of 60 cases. Six of those cases are associated with Maplecrest which we are treating as a separate outbreak, but for full transparency are including it within the Millinocket numbers. And one, one person has died in, re in relation to the Millinocket outbreak, a person who didn't attend the event. That is correct. But there are no fatalities connected to the jail yet. Also correct. Okay, great. Now, regarding the hospitalization rate, which you were talking about a moment ago, I, I believe you said that we're at less than one per 100,000 people and the national average is 15. I, I thought the national average was something closer to 150, but I, I feel like I might be sort of comparing antelopes and cantaloupes here. So um, the national average is 15 per 100,000? Uh, that is correct. Uh, that is for hospitalizations of people yeah. affected by COVID-19. Uh, we'll get you a, a citation for that. I'll, I'll show you, the. I'll send you the, the place where we get that number from. Okay. Yeah. Pl please do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, one, and Patrick, one, one sorry, one note. Are you sure you're not looking at 
you know, uh, 150 per, but we'll, we'll, we'll get you the, we'll get you the number, Patrick. I'll get you the citation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I'm, I'm wondering if there is anything to be, uh, to be said regarding, um, absentee ballots, because, uh, as of, as of yesterday, we've learned that there's sort of another change, uh, to the ballot regarding ranked choice voting. And I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anyone who can speak to whether or not there's a chance that could delay the ability of the state to, to, to mail the ballots. I, I know we're not there yet, but we're going to be there in, in the neighborhood of something like six or eight weeks. Let me butt in on that one, because uh, I have talked to the Secretary of State's office. I'm not a party to that lawsuit, but there are other parties, including interveners, who may well try to appeal, may well file an appeal, ask for an expedited appeal. appeal. But we don't expect that matter to delay uh, the distribution of absentee ballots. People are requesting them now. They're not going to get them until about 30 days out. So in terms of, and in terms of the printing of the ballots, that takes place a lot sooner, the layout and making sure that uh, the Secretary of State's office distributes the right coordination of that ballots, local and state and congressional districts, Senate, US Senate ballots, um, local house districts, which overlap with certain house Senate districts. That all happens in uh, September. And uh, so the ballots can be distributed in early October. I don't, I don't believe that the rank choice, uh, rank choice voting issue um, that arose in the Superior Court yesterday should delay that. Great to know that. Great, thanks, Patrick. I'm going to turn over to Evan. Oh, you good? Oh yeah, okay. I'm fine. I was just saying, my pleasure. Oh, uh, we're going to turn over to Evan Pop at the Main Beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you, and then a question for Governor Mills. Um, so I'll start with you, Dr. Shaw. Um, can you please clarify the recommendations if there's a uh, case of COVID or suspected case of COVID in the school? Um, the US CDC is saying that any individual has close contact, meaning being less than six feet away uh, for 15 minutes or more from a person with the virus um, should quarantine for two weeks. Um, so does that mean that an entire cohort, including teachers, um, could have to go out for two weeks if there's a confirmed or suspected case of COVID? Sure, so Evan, um, uh, let, me, let me start by just noting that we have been working, we being uh, Commissioner Lambrew and I have been working very closely with Commissioner Macon uh, at DOE on these exact issues. Uh, and and we've, we've really enjoyed working with them and collaborating. Uh, Evan, the, the guidance that you noted with respect to schools is the same guidance that applies to non-school situations as well, which is to say, and as, as we discussed with respect to York County first responders, anyone who is a close contact of a confirmed case should be in quarantine for 14 days. If they get tested and they test negative, they are still in quarantine for 14 days. And so that guidance applies whether we're talking about a fire station, a family, or a school system. Uh, and, and now the question is how we think that through and apply it in the school context. That's been the tenor of the discussions with the Department of Education. But that general principle applies not just to COVID, applies not just to school systems, but any situation involving COVID-19. Um, and just to follow up on that, that, that discussion, that's, is that sort of an ongoing discussion when it comes to the school system? Do you have any updates on that? Uh, it, it has been an ongoing discussion for many weeks, many months now, as we've thought about uh, returning to schools, returning to in-classroom education, and how to do so safely. Um, I know that DOE has been working and meeting with their stakeholders. I would probably refer other questions to the specifics over to DOE. Um, but we have, we've definitely enjoyed working with them on this very challenging issue. Thank you. Um, and then just my, my question for Governor Mills, um, kind of along that same line, um, in a case where a family may need to quarantine um, for two weeks if there's um, some sort of um, positive test in school, um, what support is available for parents who uh, may not have time off from their jobs? Well, just last week, last Thursday, we announced um, substantial grants for uh, child care, uh, with, particularly focusing on parents of children who don't have after after school care, or, pa or parents of children who uh, parents who have to work, but the children maybe they have asthma, or some other conditions that prevent them from fully engaging in the school in the regular sense. Uh, and we are supporting uh, the schools and the parents standing up additional child care programs. 
in school, out of school. We've also paid, I think, more than $8 million towards child care facilities, existing facilities, to expand their numbers uh, and to help parents get back to work. Uh, that's key to recovery of our economy, of course. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to turn now to Liz Graves from, MD from MDI. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Good afternoon. Uh, first up, I'll, I'll ask uh, one of my ongoing questions, which is about um, the metrics you all are watching for um, in other, especially nearby states, you know, hot topics in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, for whether folks from those states prevent an, and present an elevated risk when they come here. So I believe I remember you said seven day point positivity, weighted average point positivity for specifically molecular or PCR tests and then also new cases per 100,000 people. Are those, did I get that right? So we, you know, uh, Liz, we, we look, uh, our team looks at a variety of different metrics. It's not, it's not formulaic, but there's one or two uh, that, 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 that are dispositive or decide the entire outcome. But there are two that we do look at um, that, that you noted, which is the seven day weighted positivity rate which is to say accounting for the number of tests that are being done. And then uh, the number of new cases adjusted for population in the recent seven day or 14 day period. Uh, it, the epidemiologists call that incidence. Uh, and so we do look at both of those, but we also, for example, look at the complexion of the outbreaks in those states. If they are having outbreaks that are among individuals that may be likely to travel to Maine or travel at all, that tells us one thing. So we look at some quantitative as well as qualitative factors. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, oh, did anybody want to add anything? Okay. Uh, next question is about uh, the colleges, um, small outbreaks that you noted as, as colleges are opening up and they all seem to have um, really extensive testing plans. Uh, I think you mentioned that the Humane System and Colby each are, are undertaking their own contact tracing work in addition to, to what the state's doing? How is that? Sure. Um, so one, one terminology point, Liz, uh, these are both investigations at this stage. Um, and so one of, the, one of the purposes of the investigation is to learn more about the potential exposures and interconnections. Um, in terms of the contact tracing, they're, they're both doing it somewhat differently. But the bottom line is that they have invested heavily in staff as well as IT solutions that help them get a sense of where students are by looking at things like rosters uh, as well as and class uh, schedules as well as systems to check in with their students to see how their symptoms are doing things of that nature. Uh, we can ha we have the option of complementing that work with the existing contact tracing system Maine CDC uses. And for some colleges, we are, we are going down that path, but with the others, for example, the two that we talked about today, they're doing much of that on their own. Okay. And we're thankful for that partnership and welcome that opportunity. Yeah. Okay, my other two questions are very pedestrian, everyday life things. One is that um, in, when someone goes out to eat, um, sit down, whether in, inside or outside in a restaurant. Um, does a server serving a, a table at a restaurant, um, if a positive case is identified, does that count as a close contact server to, to patron? Um, so Liz, in that situation, our case investigator would really have to sit down with or get on the phone with the case as, as well as uh, others that were there to determine how intense the nature of the contact was. If the server were really quickly taking an order and then the runner was delivering the food, that might not be a close contact. But if the server was spending a lot of time interacting with the table, getting to know them, having a good conversation, and was also delivering the food, et cetera, then it could be. There's no bright line rule. It really does kind of point the light at how nuanced these outbreak investigations are. Great. So last up is um, speaking of folks, um, reminding folks not to get complacent. Is it still the guidance, the recommendation that maybe one family member should be shopping for groceries or should be, should be in a, I know retail is open and retail is not all groceries, but, but is it still 
good for, for families to think about limiting who goes where, when. It, that's not a mandate from the state, but it's a practice that I think we would all approve um, so that it's easier to trace if something is, uh, if someone does uh, test positive. Can I back up to your first question about people traveling here, just to make sure, I know we know this, I know everybody knows this, but let me be real clear, we're not preventing anybody from coming to the state of Maine, and we welcome people to travel here. The only thing we ask is, a, is of people from many states, including one of our close neighbors, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, is that they get tested first. And the last I knew, Massachusetts has stood up a lot of testing facilities, a lot of free tests, a lot of very publicly accessible testing sites. And so, and I've heard from many people who have come here who've gotten tested before they came uh, and feel safe to come here and feel, and then we feel safe having them here. So that's just the semantic difference I wanted to emphasize. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we're gonna turn now to Sam Rogers at News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, first question for you, Governor Mills. Um, obviously, with our neighbors to the west, New Hampshire opening uh, and expanding the indoor dining to 100% capacity, is there is there any plans about expanding the indoor capacity here in Maine? If not, obviously, with the colder weather coming, will there be you know any support for uh, you know outdoor outdoor heaters or, or anything like that? Yeah. Well, we didn't do the we didn't issue guidelines by capacity, by percentage. They did, we, and we did it a little differently all along the way from New Hampshire and Vermont while still talking to them a lot about what they were doing. They decided to talk about percentage of capacity. We decided to talk about spacing and basic health um, um, healthcare precautions. And that's what we're still doing. I th you know, we can anticipate that things will change as when colder weather gets here, and it won't be as amenable to, as inviting to eat outside. But I've seen a lot of people engaging in um, other efforts to, to encourage outside dining well into the cold weather months, and we encourage that. So as to, to keep the spacing requirements, keep the precautions in place that, we've, that restaurants have been particularly good at uh, cooperating with. So uh, that's what I look forward to. We're not doing exactly what New Hampshire does, no. And, and Dr. Shah, you, you make some great analogies every, every briefing. And is there any analogy um, regarding the outbreak or the connection to the outbreaks at the wedding at the Big Moose Inn and you know, obviously what's been going on at, at jails and, and fire departments around the state? Uh, is there anything just to kind of further explain the fact that this virus is able to spread fast quickly and all over. I mean, Sam, being asked to come up with an analogy on the spot is like asking a comedian to just all of a sudden, you know, start telling jokes, um, which well, is the best analogy, analogy right I can have there. Uh, you know, what I think the best analogy uh, to be candid, Sam, is it, it's, it's like um, it, there, are, there are two that I've talked about, but I think bear repeating because they do, or they are emblematic of this situation. Uh, the first, and I think perhaps the most illustrative, is that what we're dealing with is like a giant tube of glitter. And if you've ever worked with glitter or who have small children in your household, you open a tube of glitter in the basement. And then two weeks later, you're up in the attic and all you find is glitter there. And you have no idea how it got there. And that's what COVID-19 is like. You open up some glitter in, in Millinocket and the next thing you know, you're finding traces of it at a jail complex in your, in your county. It's just an emblematic of how quickly and silently and efficiently it can spread. I think you might have been waiting to use that analogy for, for a few days. Uh, and the last thing, um, Governor Mills, you know, with, with the new grant program that was announced uh, last week, you know, $200 million for, for small businesses, um, just some other hospitality groups early on this summer were asking for, you know, $800 million and uh, just wondering if this was an initial grant program and more money might be allocated in the future or, or how that will work. Yeah, no, the, the hospitality industry itself and that association that has been asking for huge amounts of money includes 
uh, some national groups, uh, hotel chains and whatnot. I am much more concerned about the small mom and pops, the bed and breakfasts, the small motels, the local businesses, small businesses that uh, stand to lose a lot more proportionally than some of the ones you're talking about or the ones who were, uh, had the loudest voices earlier this summer. And going back to the glitter, <laughs> because I was going to use that analogy, but I didn't want to because it sounded sort of um, frivolous in a way, but it's, it's a deadly glitter. Let's not be casual about it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a poisonous glitter, and it's more like a spark from a, from a campfire that spreads so quickly through a dry forest, and we're in a drought season now. Uh, I just don't want to minimize uh, the danger here. It's not like a craft fair, but it, it is in many respects like spreading glitter. Yep, no question about it. It is not to be trifled with. I mean, the virus has already taken the lives of 130 people in Maine, thousands and thousands of people, hundreds, over almost 200,000 across this across the country. Um, I'm going to turn now to Charlie at the BDN. Yeah, hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, uh, so I have two questions about the Millinocket wedding. Um, outbreak related to the wedding. The first is, uh, do you have any updates on whether any staff of the Big Moose Inn have um, tested positive and um, a number of how many of them have? Uh, as of right now, Charlie, there has been one staff member who has tested positive. However, um, I'm sorry, there have been two staff members who have tested positive. One staff member is thought to have had contact with some of the guests during or before the reception. The other staff member had no contact with the guests before, during, or after the reception. Okay. Um, and then just uh, my other one is, um, is Maine CDC uh, considering or may it, um, uh, issue any kind of a citation to the couple that hosted the wedding? Um, so what we, um, Charlie, what I can say is that we've we've been looking into that as well. Um, and right now it's under evaluation. Uh, we are taking, we want to make sure we've got all the facts. So there are some key pieces that we need to make sure we understand fully. And then we can start working with others to determine if there were any violations of any of the governor's executive orders. Um, right now, no determination has been made, partly because there are some additional facts that are needed. Even there, Charlie, I, I just wanted to underscore, similarly in connection with the question that Amy asked, given the expansion of this outbreak and the number of cases that are now connected to it, uh, we are also focused on mitigating the spread of that outbreak as well. Thank you. We're going to turn now to Morgan at WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for taking my questions today. Um, my first question is, are the 18 cases at the York County Jail associated with that 60, the, the, that total number of 60? Good, good question, Morgan. The answer is no, not at this time. They are not reflected underneath that 60. The 60 does include the six cases at Maplecrest. It does not include the York County. Uh, and, and that's on, among the reasons for that is that that identification, that linkage was just made and confirmed and vetted uh, and triple checked just a matter of hours ago. So we, we haven't changed the internal system that, you, that we use to track this. So right now they are distinct from a numerical perspective, even though we've identified this epidemiological link. Okay, thank you. Um, we've also been hearing concerns over the number of people, you know, coming back to campuses all over the state. Uh, after Maine has seen such low numbers, cases, coronavirus, case, coronavirus cases, and the concern is that while other businesses have, you know, shut down after one case, two cases, how are campuses able to continue or plan on conducting in-person learning when we're already seeing some cases? Is this a concern? And will any actions be taken in the future as we you know, continue on through the academic school year? Uh, sure, I'll start and, and then invite Governor Mills and, and Commissioner Lambrew to, to jump in. Uh, Morgan, what I will start off by saying is that the same rules that apply to any individual who is coming in the state, except from one of the five states that are exempt, 
apply to returning students, faculty, and staff members as well. And at least as to the two colleges that we've discussed today, there have been, um, they, they, have, they have worked with incoming students who are returning to campus to ensure they get that pre-arrival testing. In fact, the cases that we've talked about, at least as to Colby College, are a direct result of that pre-arrival testing. Uh, this, the colleges have systems in place to limit the exposures that those students who test positive upon their return have to minimize the spread. And we've been working with them to continue that process. So um, I, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Governor Mills and Commissioner Lambrew if they've got additional comments as well. And on mute, yeah, okay. I think all of the higher eds have been cooperative uh, and they are welcoming students back on campus in a very cautious, uh, concerning manner. Um, they're very uh, conscientious about their, their obligations to the parents of students and to the families and friends of students and to the community members uh, to whom, with whom these students are going to interact. Um, all the higher ed folks that I've been speaking with uh, and who communicated with us in recent months have been extremely co concerned and have been going you know, beyond the call of duty in a sense in, in establishing testing protocols, social contracts that the students have to sign to uh, comply with certain behavioral um, uh, rules or else not attend school there, things of that sort. And I think the parents are fairly confident about the students coming back physically to schools here because we have such low numbers and we want to keep them that way and we want their cooperation in doing so. And the last question for the afternoon goes to Allison Ross from WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you for taking my question. So just one quick question here. Will the CDC be providing more specific contact tracing? So I know we have the specific data, but are you working on anything like actually showing hotels, restaurants, shops, just so people can make more informed decisions? Um, so Allison, you know, we, we, we do that. We do have data on our website about the number of individuals who are undergoing monitoring, things of that nature. And then with respect to things like outbreaks that have occurred, um, that's, what, that's what we do twice a week. Anytime there's an outbreak that's been detected or a situation that's being investigated, uh, I report on that, whether it's at a nursing facility, a college campus, what have you, a construction site. So we've been doing that ever since day one of the outbreak so that the public does have awareness about what's going on out there and what's going on around them. At the same time, decisions about where to go uh, should not necessarily be made by, by information that's on a website. This is a fast moving virus. It exists everywhere in every quarter of the state. And so really we should all be going about things our days as if the virus were everywhere around us, as opposed to what might have happened a couple of weeks ago, because that's really what we're seeing when we're detecting outbreaks. We're seeing the after effects of transmission events that occurred, say, in the Millinocket wedding, transmission that occurred on August 7th, and we're detecting the ripples of that now. But in terms of making sure we're, we're sharing that, that is what I do in every single press briefing, is brief everyone on where things stand with outbreaks across the state. And that we've done since day one. Um, Governor, that was the last question. So I'm gonna turn things back over thank to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you all for listening and watching and for the participation of the media. Um, you know, we keep talking about our low numbers. We're not trying to brag here. We're trying to tell the facts, tell the data and, uh, and share the metrics on which we base critical decisions every day. But the fact that we have minimal numbers shouldn't allow anybody to be lulled into minimizing the dangers of this pandemic. They are still out there. I hear some people say on social media and elsewhere, well, you know, those, the old people could just stay home. The people with vulnerabilities can just stay home. As if, as if healthy people can't get sick, as if healthy people can't transmit the virus, as if folks who believe that they're healthy at least can't um, spread this virus to other people uh, as if we don't have parents, cousins, family members, people with whom we interact and neighbors and whatnot who might get very, very sick. And let's not minimize the dangers of just becoming ill from this virus, never mind dying from it or being on a ventilator for an extended period of time. So while we sort of pat ourselves on the back week after week, 
we're not letting down our guard. And I want to thank the people of Maine again for their courage, their persistence, their great patience. Stick with it. We will get through this together. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon. We'll chat again on Thursday.